From a Narrative of the Captivity by Mary Ronson, 1682. The move to an Indian village on the Ware River near Braintree, February 12th through the 27th. The morning being come, they prepared to go on their way. One of the Indians got up on a horse, and they set me behind him with my poor sick babe in my lap. A very wearisome and tedious day I had of it. What with my own wound, and my child's being so exceedingly sick, and in a lamentable condition with her wound. It may be easily judged what a poor, feeble condition we were in, there being not the least crumb of refreshing that came within either of our mouths from Wednesday night to Saturday night, except only a little cold water. This day in the afternoon, about an hour by sun, we came to the place where they intended to be an Indian town called Wenemesset, north of Quabog. I sat much alone with the poor wounded child in my lap, which moaned night and day, having nothing to revive the body or cheer the spirits of her. But instead of that, sometimes one Indian would come and tell me one hour that your master will knock your child in the head, and then a second, and then a third. Your master will quickly knock your child in the head. This was the comfort I had from them. Miserable comforters are we all, as he said. Thus nine days I sat upon my knees with my babe in my lap, till my flesh was raw again, my child being even ready to depart this sorrowful world. They bade me carry it out another wigwam, I suppose, because they would not be troubled with such spectacles. Whither I went with a very heavy heart, and sat, and down I sat with a picture of death in my lap. About two hours in the night, my sweet babe, like a lamb, departed this life on February 18th, 1675. It being about six years and five months old, it was nine days from the first wounding in this miserable condition without any refreshing of one nature or another, except a little cold water. I cannot but take notice how at another time I could not bear to be in the room where any dead person was. But now, the case has changed. I must and could lie down by my dead babe, side by side, all the night after. I have thought since of the wonderful goodness of God to me in preserving me in the use of my reasons and senses, and that distressed time that I did not use wicked and violent means to end my own miserable life. In the morning, when they understood that my child was dead, they sent for me home to my master's wigwam. By my master in this writing, you must be understood, Coinopin, who was Sagmore and married King Philip's wife's sister. Not that he first took me, but I was sold to him by another Narragansett Indian who took me when I first came out of the garrison. I went to take up my dead child in my arms to carry it with me, but they bid me let it alone. There was no resisting. But go I must and leave it. When I had been in my master's wigwam, I took the first opportunity I could get to look back after my dead child. When I came, I asked them what they had done with it, and they told me it was upon the hill. Then they went and showed me where it was where I saw the ground was newly digged. They told me they had buried it. There I left that child in the wilderness and must commit it and myself also in this wilderness condition to him who is above all. God having taken away this dear child, I went to see my daughter Mary, who was at this same Indian town at a wigwam not very far off though we had little liberty or opportunity to see one another. She was about ten years old and taken from the door at the first 
by a praying Indian and afterward sold for a gun. When I came in sight, she would fall a weeping at which they were provoked and would not let me come near her, but bade me be gone, which was a heart cutting word to me. I had one child dead, another in the wilderness. I knew not where the third child would not let me come near to me, as he said, have ye bereaved my children, Joseph is not, and Simon is not, and ye will take Benjamin also. All these things are against me. I could not sit still in this condition, but kept walking from one place to another. And as I was going along, my heart was even overwhelmed at the thoughts of my condition, and that I should have children and a nation which I knew not ruled over them. Whereupon I earnestly entreated the Lord that he would consider my low estate and show me a token for good. And if it were his blessed will, some sign and hope of some relief. And indeed, quickly the Lord answered in some measure my poor prayers. For as I was going up and down, mourning and lamenting my condition, my son came to me and asked me how I did. I had not seen him before since the destruction of the town, and I knew not where he was, till I was informed by himself that he was among a smaller parcel of Indians, whose place was about six miles off. With tears in his eyes, he asked me whether his sister Sarah was dead, and told me he had seen his sister Mary, and prayed me that I would not be troubled in reference to himself. I cannot but take notice of the wonderful mercy of God to me at those afflictions. In sending me a Bible, one of the Indians came, that came from Medfield by, had brought some plunder, came to me, and asked me if I would have a Bible. He had got one in his basket. I was so glad of it, and asked him whether he thought the Indians would let me read. He answered yes. So I took the Bible, and in that melancholy time, it came to my mind to read the first, to read first the 28th chapter of Deuteronomy, which I did. And when I read it, my dark heart wrought on this manner, that there was no mercy for me, that the blessings were gone, and the cursings come with their room, and uh, that I had lost my opportunity. But the Lord helped me to go on reading till I came to chapter 30, the seven first verses, where I found there was a mercy promised again, if he would return to him by repentance. And though we were scattered from one end of the earth to another, yet the Lord would gather us together and turn all those curses upon our enemies. I did not desire to live to forget this scripture, and what comfort it was to me. The sixth remove. We traveled on till night, and in the morning we must go over the river to Philip's crew. When I was in the canoe, I could not but be amazed at the numerous crew of pagans that were on the bank at the other side. When I came ashore, they gathered all about me. I, sitting alone in the midst, I observed, they asked one another questions, and laughed, and rejoiced over their gains and victories. Then my heart began to fail, and I fell a-weeping, which was the first time to my remembrance that I wept before them. Although I had met with so much affliction, and my heart was many times ready to break, yet I could not shed one tear in their sight but rather had been all this while in a maze, and like one astonished. But now I may say as in Psalm 137.1, by the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down, yea, when we wept, we wept when we remembered Zion. There one of them asked me why I wept. I could hardly tell what to say. Yet I answered, they would kill me. No, said he, none will hurt you. Then came one of them, gave me two spoonfuls of meal to comfort me, and another 
a half a pint of peas, which was more worth than many bushels at another time. Then I went to see King Philip. He bade me come and sit down, and he asked me whether I would smoke. A usual compliment nowadays amongst saints and sinners, but this was no way suited to me. For though I had formerly used tobacco, yet I had left it ever since I was first taken. It seems to be a bait. The devil lays to make men lose their precious time. I remember with shame how formerly, when I had taken two or three pipes, I was presently ready for another. Such a bewitching thing it is. But I thank God he has now given me power over it. Surely there are many who be better employed than to lie sucking a stinking tobacco pipe. Now, the Indians gather their forces to go against Northampton. Overnight, one went about yelling and hooting to give notice of the design, whereupon they fell to boiling of ground nuts and parching of corn, as many had it, for their provision. And in the morning, away they went. And during my abode in this place, Philip spoke to me to make a shirt for his boy, which I did, for which they gave me a shilling. I offered the money to my master, but he bade me keep it. And with it, I bought a piece of horse flesh. Afterward, he asked me to make a cap for his boy, for which he invited me to dinner. I went, and he gave me a pancake, about as big as two fingers. It was made of parched wheat, beaten and fried in bear's grease. But I thought I had never tasted pleasanter meat in my life. There was a squaw who spoke to me to make a shirt for her son up, for which she gave me a piece of bear. Another asked me to knit a pair of stockings, for which she gave me a quart of peas. I boiled my peas and bear together and invited my master and mistress to dinner. But the proud gossip, because I served them both in one dish, would eat nothing except one bit that he gave her upon the point of a knife. The move to Ashlaw Valley, New Hampshire. But instead of going either to Albany or homeward, we must go five miles up the river and then go over it, where we abode a while. Here lived a sorry Indian who spoke to me to make him a shirt. When I had done it, he would pay me nothing. But he, living by the riverside, where I often went to fetch water, I would often be putting him in mind and calling for my pay. At last, he told me if he would make another shirt for a papoose not yet born, he would give me a knife, which he did when I had done it. I carried the knife in, and my master asked me to give it to him. And I was not a little glad that I had anything that they would accept of and be pleased with. When we were in this place, my master's maid came home. She had gone three weeks into the Narragansett County, country to fetch corn, where they had stored up some in the ground. She brought home about a peck and a half of corn. This was about the time their great captain, Nanantu, was killed in the Narragansett County country. My son, being now about a mile from me, I asked Liberty to go and see him. They bade me go, and I went, and away I went, but quickly lost myself, traveling over hills and through swamps, and could not find the way to him. And I cannot but admire the wonderful power and goodness of God to me, in that, though I was gone from home and met with all sorts of Indians, and those I had no knowledge of, and there being no Christian soul near me, yet not one of them offered the least immanageable miscarriage to me. I turned homeward again and met with my master, and he showed me the way to my son. But I was fain to go and look after something to satisfy my hunger, and going among the wigwams, I went into one, and there found a squaw who showed herself very kind to me and gave me a piece of bear. I put it into my pocket and came home 
but could not find an opportunity to broil it, for fear they would get it from me. And there I lay all that day and night in my stinking pocket. In the morning, I went to the same squaw who had a kettle of ground nuts boiling, and I asked her to let me boil my piece of bear in her kettle, which she did, and gave me some ground nuts to eat with it. And I cannot but think how pleasant it was to me. I have sometimes seen bear baked very handsomely among the English, and some like it, but the thought that it was a bear made me tremble. But now that was savory to me, that one would think was enough to turn the stomach of a brute creature. One bitter cold day, I could find no room to sit down before the fire. I went out and could not tell what to do, but I went in another wigwam, where they were also sitting round the fire, but the squaw laid a skin for me and bid me sit down and gave me some ground nuts and bade me come again, and they told me they would buy me if they were able, and yet these strangers to me that I never saw before.